Meeting is now streaming live. Are we on? I believe so. Okay. All right. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. And welcome for today's uh, virtual Meet a Scientist chat provided by the Field Museum Learning Connections. I'm Lauren Wagner, and today I'm joined with Jim Louderman, the Collections Assistant of Insects, who's going to show us some of his special friends from the Insects Collection. Jim? Hi, everyone. Uh, as you know, heard my, I'm Jim Louderman, and I work in the collections at the Field Museum. Uh, so I've got the coolest job in the world. I get to play with insects and spiders and other bugs every day. Uh, our collection of insects at the Field Museum is about 25 million specimens. Uh, we are probably the third largest insect collection in the United States. Uh, we have a lot of really cool live things as well as a lot of uh, prepared material. Today, I think I'll start with something that was collected as part of my research in Northwestern Illinois. Uh, what I do in Northwestern Illinois is the Conservation Foundation in Joe Davies County uh, acquires land, usually old cornfields, and restores them to the prairies. And I do surveys to see what's living in the prairies to see if the restorations are going well and being handled properly. And we did one prairie in the town of Wapolo, and in a one-year survey, we found well over 2,000 species of insects and spiders in that prairie. So the prairie is doing really, really well, and the diversity and the density of insects is really high. But one of the coolest things we found was this. These three butterflies are eastern tiger swallowtails, and one of them is the rarest thing that ever happens in nature. The yellow one is a male, the black one is a female, and the bottom one here has one male wing and three female wings. It's called a quadrilateral mosaic gynandromorph. And it's a genetic mutation or mistake that happens way, way less than one in a billion butterflies. It also only happens in this species, Papilio glaucus. And this one was collected in Joe Davies County by me in uh, 2016. This is only the second one of these that the Field Museum has ever gotten in its collection in the 120 odd years that we've been there. So it is really the rarest thing that happens in nature. So it's really the coolest thing I've ever found. Uh, as we go along, if anyone has any questions, please send them in because I prefer to take questions as we go instead of holding them for the end. So something live. Here we have this is Lillian. Lillian is a Mexican red knee tarantula. M Mexican red knee tarantulas are very, very docile as most American tarantulas are. Most American tarantulas never bite. And the reason is their defense, the hairs on their abdomen, you can see the little bald spot, if I can get my fingers out of the way, right there. They can throw those hairs off with their back legs and they're hooked. So they throw them off to try and get them into the eyes of a predator. So they don't have to bite for defense. That's their defense. The old world tarantulas from Africa and Asia and so on don't have those hairs, those urticating hairs. And so their only defense is to bite. So they're usually more aggressive and aren't so nice to hold. But pretty much all American tarantulas can be held. I've been in Arizona and Bolivia and Costa Rica and caught tarantulas just by picking them up, them up off the ground. And I've never been bitten by a tarantula, but there are no deadly tarantulas anywhere in the world. Tarantula venom is actually considerably less than a honeybee sting. Uh, we don't allow people to hold our tarantulas anymore because there's a disease caused by frontline. The tube of stuff that you put on the neck of a dog or a cat for fleas and ticks has a chemical in it called erythrin and it's an arachnicide. And what it does is it gives the tarantulas a neurological disease so that instead of walking, they just kind of bounce around and they fall over. And people, if you have a dog or you've had a dog that has it on, it's on your hands and it stays on your hands for about a week. You can't wash it off easily. So if you hold a tarantula, it gets up in their book lungs, which are their breathing apparatus, which are on the underside of their abdomen, right about here. And it's just four little slits that they breathe through. So we don't let, let people hold the tarantulas anymore. I do have dogs, but we don't use frontline on our dogs for fleas and ticks. So it's okay for me to hold the tarantulas. So 
So, Jim, we did have a question here. Okay. What is ahead. your favorite arachnid to work with? My favorite arachnid to work with? Oh, it used to be tarantulas, but now I kind of like uh, what are called vinegaroons. And let's see, I've got one here someplace. Here we go. Come on out. This is a vinegaroon. This is related to scorpions, but these don't have a tail with a stinger, so they can't sting you. And their defense is this little thing on the back here, if I can get her turned around the right way. It is a female. Right here on the back end, there's a little spigot, and they shoot acetic acid out of that. And acetic acid smells like vinegar, so that's where they get the name vinegaroon. They do have pretty good pinchers. They can pinch. Uh, they aren't going to draw blood or anything or give you a cut, but they can pinch and you'll feel it. Uh, and this particular species is found in Texas. So they are in the U.S. They're pretty much all over the world in, and they're desert animals. So they're found pretty much all over the world in deserts. Um, they don't get very much bigger than this. Maybe a little bit in some of the tropics can get to be maybe that big. Maybe, maybe two inches longer than this one. So they're kind of cool animals and I've never been bitten by one. And of course you can't be stung because they don't have a stinger and they don't have any venom. Kind of like uh, daddy long legs. Everybody knows that a daddy long leg is not really a spider, right? They're actually uh, harvestmen and daddy long legs. There's a, a old wives tale that daddy long legs have the most potent venom of any spider in the world but their fangs are too small to deliver a bite. Well, in fact, as we just found out, they aren't spiders. They don't have fangs and they don't have venom. And the way you can tell the difference between a daddy long leg and a spider, whoop, there goes the vinegaroon. Spiders have a waist between their, their thorax and their abdomen. Daddy, daddy long legs don't have that waist. They're all connected as one piece. Now, Jim, can you clarify the difference between an insect and an arachnid for our oh, viewers? Sure. Let me get out an insect. Absolutely. Uh, here we go. Here we go. This is a death head cockroach. I'm going to get them up as close as I can. Can you see the, what looks kind of like a jack-o'-lantern skull on the back? Right up here on the front. Yes. Are, it, yeah. So these are called there death head is. cockroaches. These are herbivores, so they only eat fruits and vegetables. They live in trees and they have wings, but they can't actually fly. Oh, there, there we go. They, they can't actually fly. So when fruit gets ripe and it falls out of the trees, they jump out of the tree and they spread their, spread their wings and they coast. They glide down to the ground, get down to the ground and eat the food and then climb back up in the tree. So the easiest way to tell the difference between an insect and an arachnid is the leg. Insects have six legs. Can we see them all here? And arachnids have eight legs, whether it's a daddy long leg or a vinegaroon or a spider, they all have eight legs. So that's the easiest way to tell the difference between an insect and a, a spider. Some people might think that insects you can tell an insect because it has wings, but not all insects have wings. And no juvenile insects have wings. Let me get out. Uh, where are they? Here, here they are. Get out a couple of Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Let me find a female here, I've got a male. So Jim, while we wait for you to get another insect out, one of our questions came from our audience members is, what was the name of your dog that you shared the oh, picture of? My dog, his name is Cooper. And he is a uh, Newfoundland poodle mix. And he weighs about 85 pounds now, but he is what's known as a gentle giant. He's the docilest insect animal in the world. He just loves everybody. He loves all other animals. He's just really sweet. So his name is Cooper. 
Okay, this is a Madagascar hissing cockroach. This one is a male, and this one is a female. And the way you tell the difference, these horns on the front, on the back of the male, the female doesn't have that. Uh, so you see these are both adult, an adult male and an adult female, and they have no wings. So not all insects have wings. Some species just don't. And they're called hissing cockroaches because they hiss. Let's see if I can get this guy to hiss. Sometimes. If he won't hiss, I'll try to get another one. One of them will hiss. Let's get another one out and get one of them to hiss. Can you hear him? They aren't being very cooperative today. And here, this one, if we can get it on, whoop, this little tiny one here is a baby that was just born within the last week, if I can get a hold of it. Can you see it there on my finger? That's a baby and it's about a week old. So one of the females did lay an egg sac. And in these types of cockroaches, the female keeps the egg sac inside until she's ready, to, until they're ready to hatch. She then pushes the egg sac out and within minutes, the babies hatch. So you can see the difference in size here. They're, that's how they start out about that size. So it's about a week old. That's when they first appeared. Any other Good. questions yet? We do have some more. Now, Jim, what do these cockroaches eat? And are these diff do they eat things that are different than the cockroaches that we might find in like our houses and buildings? Okay, the German cockroaches and the Oriental cockroaches that we find in our buildings are garbage eaters. They will eat almost anything. Meat, vegetable, uh, German cockroaches move around because they get into corrugated cardboard, the, the corrugation, and they eat the glue. Uh, they'll eat paper, they'll eat almost anything. These are herbivores. They eat fruits and vegetables. That's really the only thing they eat. We do give them some flake fish food for a little extra protein and to help them reproduce. I do have colonies of all these cockroaches. Uh, so we do give them the fish food, the flake fish food to help them be stronger and reproduce better. Uh, but again, the fish food is mo mostly plant matter. Uh, so they're all herbivores. Also, if they do get away, they can't survive here. They're tropical. Uh, if one were to get outside on a day like today, it would die almost immediately because it's too cold. Uh, tropical insects, the way, okay, so the way insects in the, our area, in temperate areas where it gets cold in the winter survive, is they go into what's called diapause. And diapause is like hibernation. But what insects do is they turn their blood into antifreeze, basically alcohol. They pump that into every cell in their body so that when it gets cold, the cell, the liquid in the cell doesn't expand and burst. It doesn't freeze. So the cells don't burst. In the tropics, because it doesn't get cold, they don't do that. They can't produce that alcohol. So tropical insects can't do that. They do go into diapause. They just don't produce the alcohol. They just go to sleep for the, for the dry season when there's no food to eat. So that's how, how insects survive the, the winter in, the, in temperate areas and uh, the dry season in tropical areas. Uh, and the tropical insects can't produce the, the uh, antifreeze, so they can't survive up here. Oops, I've got my pocket roach here. There he is, or she is, There's a, that's my pocket roach. I often keep one of these in my pocket when I'm doing programs. Most people have a pocket watch, I have a pocket roach. Okay. Now the top won't open on this thing. So we had another Put question here from an audience okay. member. They'd like to know, it does, uh, how, why does it take so long for cicadas to hatch and come out of the ground? Oh, okay. Uh, that's the periodic cicadas. There's two different types of cicadas here. There's the periodic cicadas, which are actually nymphs or babies underground for almost 17 years. And so they, they lay their eggs in tree branches when, and they hatch, they fall out of the trees, they go down, attach themselves to a root of a tree and they suck juices out of the tree roots for 17 years. And then just before that 17 years is over, they 
come out, attach themselves to a tree, and pull themselves out of their shell, open their wings, uh, fly away, mate, lay more eggs, and the process happens over again. There are also what are called dog day cicadas, and they're cicadas that come out every year. They don't stay under the ground as long. They stay under the ground for a few years, but not 17, but they are out, they come out every year. So there's two different, and then there's also small cicadas that are only about this big. that are called prairie cicadas. They come out every year and they live in prairies and live on grass roots and, and plant roots rather than tree roots. Okay, so we have a tarantula at the museum whose name is Rosie. And this is Rosie's cage. And she lives in that web in the corner. And unfortunately, Rosie can't come out anymore because she, she does have a story. She actually has, where did I put it? Lost it. Her own book. There it is. Here we go. Rosie is a tarantula that got away and was gone for three months in the museum. And this book, Rosie the Tarantula, is a story of all of her adventures when she was gone. And it starts out with me, with Rosie on my head. And you know, why don't we do that with, here we go. Did I have this tarantula out yet today for the program? I don't remember if I pulled her out yet. I think this, at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, I did pull her out. But so just to see, show you that the book is actually true. There we go. And this is the story of Rosie's adventures as she wandered around the museum for three months and all the different places she went when she was gone. And her favorite place was in anthropology. She would go to anthropology every night or every morning when the people showed up and find a pot to crawl into and hide. And then at night she would come out and hunt for hunt for the cockroaches, the, the German and or German cockroaches that we have in the museum and the American cockroaches. And the way we know that this is a true story is when Rosie came back, she told me all of her adventures. And this is a book that was done by Peggy McNamara, our artist in residence. And it is available online in the bookstore. And if, when we finally get back to the museum, I will have copies of the book that are available. And, if, and we use it as a fundraiser for insects. And if you buy the book from me, Rosie and Peggy McNamara and I will sign it. So if we ever get back to the museum, we'll start doing that again, hopefully in the next few months. Okay. Uh, Jim, one of our audience members wanted to know, did you always want to be a scientist and specifically study insects? Um, I've always loved insects. Uh, actually, it goes back to when I was five and there was a periodic cicada emergence. And I would run around and pick up the nymphs off of the trees, bring them home, put them in my window screen and watch them emerge, watch them spread their wings and dry. And then I'd open the window and let them fly away. So I've really always loved insects ever since then. And I always wanted to be an entomologist, a person who studies insects. And when I was in my mid forties, I had an opportunity to go back to school, get a degree. And while I was getting my degree in environmental biology, I started volunteering at the Field Museum and then got a couple of jobs on grants. And then after about five years, a collections assistant position opened up and I got that and I've been there ever since. So I've been there about 25 or 26 years now. Love what I do, love my job. Never gonna retire, I hope. <laughs> and something that I think is really important, if you have a job you love you'll never work another day in your life. I haven't worked for over 25 years. I go to work every day, but I haven't worked for 25 years. So find something you really like to do, whether it's being an auto mechanic or an entomologist or an accountant, find something you really, really love to do 
stay in school and get whatever education you need to be able to do that job. And you'll be the happiest person in the world. I know I am since I started working at the museum 25 years ago. Just the best, best thing in the world. Okay, let's get these guys out. Does anybody know what these guys are? Whoop. They don't hold on real good. These are what are called mealworms and they're super mealworms. There's one. They're super mealworms and they get much bigger than the standard mealworm. And the, what these are, these are beetle larvae. So these are baby beetles. And the beetles they turn into are these. There we go. This is a super mealworm beetle. It's a Tnebrionid, the family Tnebrionidae, or a darkling beetle. They have really hard shells. And these, there's really nothing that eats these because they produce a chemical that they squirt out of their hind end. And the chemical smells like, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, tannic acid. It's really, really strong. And tannic acid comes from what they eat. They eat a lot of wood, especially oak, which is really full of tannins. And they turn that into tannic acid, which is their defense against being eaten. But the tannins in the oak, humans actually like tannins. It's what makes red wine taste good, is tannins. So tannins do taste good in low concentrations and things like red wine. But in high concentrations, they smell really, really bad. And they can give you a, a very, very minor chemical burn, basically staining your skin. So Jim, we got some questions in the chat about okay. Rosie. So okay. one of our viewers wanted to know, how do you know what Rosie ate or how does Rosie catch their prey? Okay, spiders, uh, tarantulas are actual hunters. They go out and crawl around and actually look for food and pounce on it. And tarantulas, like all spiders, are insectivores. They eat insects. Uh, they'll eat pretty much any insect that's the size of a cricket or bigger. So they won't eat the, uh, the, the superworms because they, they smell bad, but they'll eat almost any insect the size of a cricket or bigger. So you just put the crickets in their tank when they get hungry. They find one, they grab it, they eat it. And spiders eat with kind of an interesting thing. They, they eat with what's called spit and suck. They bite the insect. They inject their venom into the insect, which also has the digestive fluid in it. The venom then digests the insect inside the body of the insect, and they suck the liquid digested insect back out. Spiders can't chew anything. They don't have any mouth parts to chew. Their only mouth parts are their fangs. So they can only eat liquid. Also, spiders will only eat live insects. If you take an insect and kill it and throw it into a spider web, the spider and make the spider web move like the insect, the spider will come out, touch the insect with its palps and front legs. And because it's starting to decay, and give off the smell of decay, the spider will then just cut that insect out of the web and drop it. They will only catch and eat prey that's actually alive. And that's true of all spiders. Not all spiders uh, eat their mates. Some spiders like the black widow and some of the other web spinning spiders, when they mate, the female eats her mate, kind of like praying mantis eat their mate, the female eats their mate. And there's a big, a good reason for that. The reason that spiders and praying mantis eat their mate is it gives the female a protein boost. It gives her a big bunch of protein so she can make bigger, better, stronger eggs. So it's really important for the females to be able to get, eat their mate. Things like tarantulas, they don't eat their mate because the males are faster and have longer legs and the male would more often eat the female, so it would be counterproductive. It would not be good for the spiders, for the tarantulas to eat the females. 
Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Oh. Jim, could you quickly tell us how Rosie got her name? Uh, her pink toes look kind of, are kind of rose colored. So we named her Rosie. Uh, we named her Rosie. We got her as a juvenile and didn't know if she was a boy or a girl. But we named her Rosie when we first got her, hoping she'd be a girl. And we always like to get female tarantulas if possible, because females live much, much longer than males. A female tarantula, a Mexican red, lee, red knee like uh, we had out, the female of those can live up to 30 years and males of, can only live about five years. Uh, a pink toe like uh, Rosie, the males can live again about five years, but the females can live about 12 years. So we always like to get a female if possible, just because they live longer. Okay, here we go. This is a scorpion. This is a flat rock scorpion. These are from Tanzania. They come from Africa. And this is the one species of scorpion that I'll actually hold because they're not known to sting. Can you see how she's got her tail curled to the side? Yes. These, these live under rocks and logs. So they keep their tail curled to the side so they can get in underneath the rock. And because their tail is kept curled to the side all the time, they literally can't sting you. So their defense is really just to pinch with their claws. And I've been pinched by these. It kind of feels like somebody going like this to you. It doesn't really hurt. Their claws aren't real sharp or hard or big. Uh, I've been pinched a number of times, not a big deal. And the venom of these is so weak, it's really kind of like a mosquito bite. So if one of these were to sting a person, it's, no, it's not a big deal. And it doesn't itch after, after it stings you. So it's just a little like a pin trick and it's not a big deal. But this is the one species that I will actually hold. And they're just really docile. And scorpions are active at night. So during the day, they really don't move around very much when it's light, they just kind of sit there. Uh, it's too light right now, but at night in the dark, if you have a black light or an ultraviolet light and you shine an ultraviolet light on a scorpion, they glow. They glow blue green. Uh, I do have black lights, but I've tried it in when it's daylight like this and they just don't glow. You just can't see it. So I didn't bring the, bring the ultraviolet light today. Okay, let's see, what do we have about I think we have time minutes. for two more minutes, exactly. And okay. so one more, a couple more questions and one more insect. Okay. While you get that next one out, Jim, our next question comes from mm. one of our viewers. They'd like to know, since you've had so many insects and arachnids from all over the world, if you could study mm. one, where would it be and why? Okay. Um, you really wouldn't study one. What you would do is study a family of insects or a genus of insects. The insects that I work on most are uh, longhorn beetles and the family Cerambicidae. Uh, I work on native U.S. Cerambicids. Uh, they're really cool. They're really colorful. They're very diverse. Uh, I really like them. A lot of them are actually pests. So studying them to find out what they're doing and how to control them is important. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of out in Wyoming and in the Rocky Mountains where there are whole big areas of pine trees that are dead. And if you remember the big fire out in, or you probably, it was probably too long ago for you, but there's a big fire out in one of the national parks. And the reason for that is they, when they log a lot of these places, they cut down all the trees and then burn everything. And then they replant one species of pine tree because they're fast growing and they make good lumber for, for paper and two by fours and things. But there's a beetle, a longhorn beetle uh, that lives there. And because there's only one species of tree, the population sometimes get out of control and they kill huge areas of pine trees. So then when there's a fire in that area, it just gets totally, totally out of control. Okay, this guy, this is a cockroach. 
This is called a domino cockroach. They're from South America. They're kind of cool. They look like a domino. And again, these are herbivores and they're tropical. So again, they, could, they can't, can't do any damage if they get away, but they're just really cute little cockroaches. Okay, another question? You said you had a couple? I do. So what is your favorite insect in the collection and why? My favorite insect in the collection is the uh, gynandromorph. Uh, just because it's so rare and the fact that I, I was the one that got to collect it. So this is really my favorite insect. And just because it's rare, uh, it's the rarest thing that ever happens in nature. And the fact that I was the one that was lucky enough to collect it. So I think we got time for one more. So besides one, the gyandromorph, what is the rarest species of butterfly? The rarest species would be the bird wing butterflies. Uh, it's a bunch of different species and they have been very heavily collected and their habitat has been heavily logged. So there's not good habitat for them anymore and then they're heavily collected. So they're all really, really rare. Uh, they're in the same family, Papilio, as the Gynandromore swallowtail. So they're in the same family, Papilionidae, but they're all found in Madagascar and they're just really, really rare. They're all on the endangered species list. So those are the rarest butterflies in the world. Thanks, Jim. Okay. And thanks for showing us your insects and your arachnids today. Thank you all for joining us today. I Thank hope you, you enjoyed our, our uh, presentation. And please feel free to submit some more questions that you have to Jim, and we'll email them to him to answer them for you. Thank Have you a great for coming, day, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye, everybody.